Hello, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning into this episode of the Ask Dr. Tony Show, where Dr. Tony Atwood answers your questions about autism. Hello, Dr. T. It's always good to see you. Can you tell me how you're faring with the pandemic over there in Australia? Ah, oh, hi, Greg. Good to see you, and, and good to reconnect with the universe here with uh, <laughs> Ask Dr. T. Um, as far as uh, COVID and so on goes, we're okay here. However, from my own perspective, uh, a few days ago, I was uh, diagnosed with shingles. Oh my. And in part, shingles can be triggered by stress, which is nature's way of getting shingles, shingles is to say, um, take it easy, take a rest. And I'm going to have to take that seriously. So, uh, yeah, otherwise, I'm okay. Um, fighting the virus, but let's go ahead with some fascinating questions, and I'm eager to contribute. Excellent. Here we go. The first question is about self-esteem. Hello, Dr. Tony. I'm wondering why autists are natural worriers and can remember criticism even after years and act according to these criticisms until it becomes something like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Wow, a very important question. And for many autistic individuals, their greatest challenge in life is not necessarily autism, it's anxiety or depression. Why autistic individuals are so prone to anxiety, we think is a mixture of, of genetic and neurological, family history of anxiety, the neurological structures that are associated with anxiety in the amygdala and connections to the frontal lobe aren't working as effectively. But what also seems to occur when I talk to autistic adults about their memory system, and they seem to remember negative events rather than positive events. One of the things that, that neurotypicals tend to do is, is have um, a way of proofreading memories and focusing on the good bits, the nice days, the happiness and so on. Whereas in autism, there tends to be an over-focus on the negatives, including criticism. And what may happen there is others may bully or tease you and so on. And then that becomes a belief system that I'm stupid, that I'll never have a friend or uh, I'm weird and, and so on. And that filtering system mentally is almost as though when you're looking around the world in your memories and in your current day, you will only allow through that filtering system that which confirms your belief. Okay, which strengthens it. But anything else, a, a therapist, a family member who says, no, don't, it's not so bad, etc. It's heresy to your belief. So it's a question of recognizing that this is what psychologists would call maladaptive thinking. So you need to check the evidence and what I call an antidote to poisonous thoughts. That was actually created by a teenage autistic individual many years ago and, and said, Tony, I have these poisonous thoughts. So I've created an antidote for each one. For example, um, I'm, I'm stupid, but I'm a chess champion. Um, I will never have a, a friend, but I've got great family. So it's finding out what are your poisonous thoughts and finding an antidote. Now, you may have that in your mind. You may have it on your phone. But I am concerned about self-esteem and anxiety is very powerful in autism. Mm. And self-esteem yes. is a theme. Hi, I'm currently in the process of getting diagnosed and I'm trying my best to improve my self-esteem after years of bullying at home and at school. I think I'm now very good at masking and I can cover any abnormalities up with humor most of the time but I'm falling constantly into self-hatred and I've been suicidal for two years now. It's pretty safe to say that the bullying and isolation have really left their mark, which typically just affect me when I'm alone. However, I've noticed recently that it's making me mean to other autistic people, maybe even more in kind than most NTs. Whenever I see someone I recognize as being autistic, self-soothing, or doing something else that I got made fun for, I really get annoyed. I snap at my brother, who has a lot of the same mannerisms as me, but that's only because I don't want him to get bullied. On the other hand, I still feel this upset when someone is talking about their special interest and they're being treated well. These feelings, they're just, they're really complicated. Seriously, what's wrong with me? I should be happy that these traits are being more accepted 
and that I'm not alone. How can I stop feeling like this? Okay, I think you have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and you're getting flashbacks. And whenever there is something that reminds you of an event, bullying and teasing in your childhood, you get a flashback and you react accordingly as though it was in the moment, not 10, 20, 30 years ago, etc. So uh, you're not wrong, you, you've got PTSD. PTSD occurs in autism because of neurotypicals, I'm afraid. They can do horrendous damage to your self-esteem and so on, and self-acceptance. You might consider uh, talking to a psychologist that works with PTSD with uh, strategies such as EMDR, which we're finding very successful for autistic individuals. So when you see this, it's a reminder of those, but also with your brother, it, it's a protection for him. You want him to hide the sign so he doesn't experience the same thing you do. So it's a lovely brotherly family support that you've got. But it means that you've got confusing or conflicting feelings. Do I suppress or encourage autistic features? Um, I do think in, in this situation, it, it is recognizing that autism isn't all negative. There are positives like the special interests, etc. But I think the bullying and teasing has given you PTSD and you're having flashbacks when those circumstances are seen again. Hello. I have three daughters, ages 11, 9, and 7, who, as you say, have pure autism. I likely have it as well, but I have no official diagnosis. The older cycles through bouts of depression and feeling worthless. The middle suffers heavily from anxiety and confidence. The younger is extremely defensive and self-sabotages. I work a lot on each of them, identifying their motions, where they are coming from, and not projecting them onto the wrong things. Do you have any advice on guiding them to self-acceptance, being okay, and feeling like life is worth living? I struggle with this, so I feel I'm not the best example for them. I am still faking being okay for them. Okay, first of all, thank you for working on emotions. I think that's very, very important. But you're now moving into a new dimension that's, I think, in some ways equally important. Personality, who are you? When I'm involved in a diagnostic assessment of an adult, I'll often ask, I've only just met you, who are you? I don't know, that's why I'm here, I don't know. And so it's exploring personality. Now, if you're working with your daughters on emotions, you may have heard of alexithymia, that is a lack of words, speech really, to express thoughts and feelings. Now, I've coined the term Alexi persona. That is a lack of vocabulary to describe personality types. So this is an area I would like you to suggest is a new project for you, for your daughters. It's going through a list of positive personality adjectives. In the book Michelle Garnett and I wrote called Exploring Depression, at the back, we have a list of positive personality adjectives. The difficulty in autism, if you say, what's your personality? I don't know. And have great difficulty converting their concept of self into speech. So if you have an external prompt, a lot of lists of kind, uh, happy, funny, makes jokes, um, uh, thoughtful, a whole range of things, and ask the person just to circle those that they recognize in themselves. But we would also ask them, um, who's your hero in the family or TV and things like that? What personality characteristics do they have that you would like to have? And what we do is we create an old fashioned uh, ring bind. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we take at the top of each page, blank page on, in, in, the, in the ring binder, is a personality, humor, for example, that you have a great sense of humor. And then we created as a diary that whenever you crack a good joke or comment, we put it in the book because mm -hmm. you're good at humor. It may be an act of kindness. It may be something you created in craft or, or work uh, aspects, etc. cetera. Um, it's going through what are the qualities that you have in personality. And these are examples. And if this is a personality quality you would like, but don't necessarily have yet. These are movements towards that particular characteristic. Now, one of the major ones is being incredibly 
brave mm-hmm. to keep going where most other neurotypicals would have probably given up. You are incredibly brave. You are heroic in the challenges you face. And if anybody else knew the struggles you have in going to school and the friendships and the bullying and the teasing and the meanness of girls to each other and trying to cope in the pressure of your peer group and so on. And yet there you are trying to cope. That is a personality quality. You are very determined. You are incredibly brave. We also, in Who Are You, create a collage with pictures of things that are important to you in your imagination, Mm -hmm. words that describe you. And it's usually working with a parent. The children are 11, 9 and 7, so it would be appropriate. And you create a collage that represents yourself. Now, this is going to change over time. So every few years, it may be a new collage. But we also go with that age. Um, If you were an animal, what animal would you be? And a lot of autistic individuals uh, will say a dog. Yes, loyal, trustworthy and so on. But we'll also say a bird. I love to be able to fly and to be free. And some have said, I'm a chameleon. I, I really change according to the situation. Or I'm a mud skipper, mm-hmm. that I live in two different worlds. Or I'm a skunk. I, I like my own kind and other people don't <laughs> like me, <laughs> pull away from me. So, but then we go through who's a snake? Who's to be avoided? Who's a wolf? in sheep's clothing. So with your daughters, I would start to explore aspects of personality in themselves that they would like to have. Now, whenever they move move towards that and show those qualities, point it out that you are moving in, that yes, you have difficulties in interpersonal skills. However, it's your personality is more important in the long term and will be important in friendships, relationships and career. Wow. What an insightful solution. More about esteem. Finding peace. Dr. Tony, in a speech from 2016, you made a statement about one finding peace with their Asperger's. And to paraphrase your quote, some will finally get it. They acquire the degree of social knowledge, cohesion, and acceptance. So how does an Aspie adult finally get it? How can they acquire the degree of social knowledge, cohesion, and acceptance? This is where I'm considering autism in the social side as potentially developmental delay rather than eternal absence. And it's like completing a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. Each piece of the puzzle is a component of social engagement and so on. And over the years, you're looking for patterns and sequences and so on, and little bits fit together. But you're trying to complete this 5,000 piece puzzle without the box top picture, which is the intuition that neurotypicals have. Everything fits together. I can solve this puzzle. But it means that over time, little bits start to fit together. You have an increasing mental filing cabinet of social situations that may be similar to the one that your experience is, that you can open the filing cabinet, take out the file mentally and then read and understand what to do or remember in a tv show or something like that when this has occurred so you create um should we say a a script in that also what can occur is you need a mentor that is someone who can tell you when you got it right what you need to know now that may be a family member friend teacher it's difficult to identify but it often helps to have someone who gives you feedback on your social skills. Now, in acceptance, Nine Degrees of uh, Autism is a book, Nine Degrees of Autism, a developmental model by Philip Wiley, Wen Lawson and Luke Beard and published by Routledge. The Nine Degrees of Autism, and I'll go through those because I think they're important. The first degree is being born on the autism spectrum. That is, you don't choose to have autism, it's who you are. The second degree is actually knowing you're different. Usually around six to eight years old, you realize I'm not like the other kids. There's something different about me here and I'm not quite sure what it is. Now, the third degree is that difference and stress may lead to secondary physical and mental health problems. That can be depression, self-harm, 
all those sorts of things that may occur in the teenage years that bring you to the attention of psychological and psychiatric services. Now, the fourth degree is self-identification, to start to achieve an accurate sense of who am I? Not necessarily who do people want me to be, but who am I? Hopefully based on strengths rather than weaknesses and not based on criticisms from peers or family members. So that's the fourth degree of autism. The fifth degree is considering all the options and it's closure with regard to past injustices. The difficulty in having closure is you can't understand why people would be, behave like that. So you keep ruminating about it because I can't get this. This is weird. And so you're trying to find a solution. And eventually you may say, I may never find a solution. I'm not going to let it contaminate my life. And that you have a wide range of options based on your strengths in personality and abilities. Now, the sixth degree is a crisis of identity and a resolution to live with autism. It's a part of you and recognizing that it is, and as we say, be a first-rate Aspie rather than a second-rate neurotypical. So the seventh degree is self-acceptance. New areas of fulfillment and enjoyment and the acquisition of abilities and experiences that have previously seemed elusive. The eighth degree is service to society. And quite a few of the adults that I see are saying, I want to help autistic teenagers. I want to be a mentor to a, an autistic person. I want to use my wisdom and experience to make sure others don't go through the same difficulties that I had. And the ninth degree is recognition, mastery, and unity. And one of the best examples is Temple Grandin of the ninth degree of autism. So I think that's a very perceptive description. Wow. Thank you for bringing all that to our attention. Now, people often write in to us about problems, but occasionally somebody will write in with a celebration. This one is called Found Peace. Being an Aspie is the best thing that ever happened to me. Why don't other Aspies feel like that, or do they? Why is stress being placed on our needing to conform? In the course of Darwinian evolution, I believe that Aspies are the next level humanity. Is this a novel opinion, or do others think as I do? <laughs> I think as you do. I, I think, watch out, neurotypicals, you're a dying breed. This is the era of information and logic and so on. So I think that society is starting to recognize the value of autism as the forefront of where we're going to evolve. One of the, the difficulties in autism, as much as I mentioned a little while ago about anxiety, there can also be a sense of pessimism. And I'm a great believer in optimism. And I think in autism, it's difficult to achieve optimism and to perceive yourself in a positive way because that negativity has been introduced by society and especially in a diagnostic sense as a disorder, that there's something wrong with you to be corrected rather than recognized and, and celebrated. And also recognizing that many autistic behaviors are actually coping mechanisms, such as social withdrawal, because I'm socially uh, uh, confused, uh, routines and rituals to reduce anxiety and so on. So what we're trying to do is actually promote diversity and acceptance. And, and as a Star Trek fan, it's like Spock and Star Trek. And we value Spock um, in his qualities on the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So it is important to find peace and not only for the autistic person to find peace, but for neurotypicals to find peace for the autistic person. The next category is causes of ASD. Hello, Dr. Atwood. Is it known if trauma in utero, specifically the third trimester, can lead to ASD? Or is this more likely to be developmental trauma disorder? Mm, what an interesting question. We do recognize that trauma in childhood, that includes infancy, uh, such as neglect and abuse, can lead to autistic behaviors. Autism is defined by how you behave, but there are different pathways to that particular profile of behavior, which includes trauma. And so as a clinician, sometimes I'm having to disentangle 
how much is trauma and how much is autism and they're not mutually exclusive mm -hmm. now that can be identified because we have some knowledge of infancy toddlerhood and so on to go through as to what may have produced the trauma however when we look at the third trimester one of the things we're looking at is whether there could be any stress hormones um, or drugs that will affect the uh, child. Now, that can be uh, increased stress hormones may affect brain development and so on. That's a possibility, mm -hmm. but nobody's proved it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know that certain drugs, legal and illegal drugs, can be associated with autism. So it's possible that if there was stress in the mother at the time and she may have been using drugs, this may have, um, through the uh, placenta, crossed over into the brain and affected the uh, baby's development in that way. So all I can say is it is a plausible suggestion awaiting confirmation. Mm -hmm. The next category is getting and keeping a job. Where are all the autistic managers? It seems that we're barred from management and leadership roles unless we mask everything or start our own companies, neither of which is feasible for many. How can we be our authentic autistic selves and obtain management and leadership roles? And if there are no autistic managers, how will companies ever hope to become autism friendly? There are autistic managers and there is information um, what I'm going to pass on is, is part of this is what resources could be useful. A book published a little while ago called Managing with Asperger Syndrome by Malcolm Johnson. That's not the author's actual name. It's a pseudonym. Malcolm uh, used to work for the BBC in London in a managerial capacity. He has a diagnosis of autism and uh, as the person who recognizes those characteristics in himself goes through and provides management of people, um, policies, all sorts of things like that, that are very relevant. Unfortunately, as far as I know, it's the only book that links autism and management, but it's a starting point. Now, the next thing is, one of the things I really admire about autism is when the person has a problem, their view is, okay, I will find information on it. Now, the thing is, what you can do is learn the skills. They're not impossible to learn. <clears throat> There are actually many books on management skills. There's MBAs you can get, etc. There are videos on YouTube and so on, on management strategies. And also autobiographies of famous managers. So what the autistic individual can do is say, OK, I'm going to find information and identify which management systems, categories and abilities can I adopt that I have in myself or acquire to be successful. So I would say it's not impossible. It's just that you need to learn mm -hmm. what to do. Speaking of books, Speaking I think you books. have an announcement. Ah, oh, oh, thanks. This, this, how shall I put it, is now a commercial break. <laughs> um, a new book uh, with Michelle Garnett and I called Autism Working, a seven stage plan to thriving at work. Um, we go through aspects of work skills uh, and challenges are if you have autism um, in the workplace, such as uh, social skills or um, executive functioning, sensory sensitivity and so on. And you complete a whole range of uh, sections to eventually find a plan just for you based on that. There are a lot of videos, including videos that are for managers to understand you um, but also aspects of legitimizing the challenges that you face. Published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers, and it was published in October. So it's only been out a month, and Autism Working, Seven Stage Plan. Congratulations, and thank you for another contribution. Now, living with ASD. If I improve, can I remove my ASD label? Dear Dr. Tony, I'm a senior at a Chinese senior high school. I've been diagnosed with ASD in June of this year, but for lack of time in diagnosing, my psychiatrist used approximately 35 minutes to reach the conclusion that I may be autistic. However, 
Fast forward to November, the time, this time of year. I felt some symptoms, like lack of social drive and interpersonal skills, had disappeared for the first time in my life. I also felt urged to develop a deep relationship again, but I still largely prefer to be alone. This alleviation of ASD symptoms may be due to a friend actively reaching out for me on a weekly basis because he was kind of lonely, and my increase in group physical activities like basketball. Should I take the ASD label off of me now? Interesting point. Yes, there can be an improvement in autism over time. What we look at is autism pure and autism plus. If it's plus uh, ADHD, depression, anxiety disorder, uh, specific learning difficulties, dyslexia, for example. If it's autism plus, especially anxiety and depression, the prognosis is not so good and those factors will inhibit the person's ability in a variety of ways. If it's autism pure, it is, as I was talking earlier, a little bit like completing the social jigsaw puzzle, eventually you get there. And I do undiagnose people, only if they, it goes to their benefit. But it means that they have moved to below the threshold for a diagnosis. In DSM-5, there has to be a threshold, really, to uh, justify access to uh, uh, ins uh, health insurance and, and government funding. They have to be a level of expression that really warrants intervention. And here the person is a character, it's a personality, mm -hmm. but it's not requiring psychological, psychiatric medical help. So the person has gone below that particular threshold and that can occur over time. Um, now, um, can you take the label off? Uh, if you're at high school, it may be a bit premature yet to, to do that. I would be a bit cautious. Um, in regards to the label, the question is, who needs to know? Now, if you are at high school, you may be heading to university. And the label may be helpful in university accommodations of your autism and the support that you need. So if the diagnosis is of value to you and improves your circumstances and understanding, then please use it. But then the question is that you've got a friendship developing. Should you disclose that to your friend? I would be cautious until you can trust them. There may come a time when that friend notices you're a bit eccentric and different and unconventional, and then you say, well, there's a reason I have autism and so on. And then the positive friendship qualities associated with that. So you're, to answer, if I improve, can I remove my ASD level? Yes, you can. But I would say, if you're at high school, a bit premature at this stage. Mm -hmm. The next category is faking it. Hello, Dr. Tony. I'm wondering what's better to work on my personality, improvision and acting or social skills training? One of the things that you've done here is you either act, you have a persona, um, which I call um, being a robot. <laughs> and you're a robot that this is what I do. OK, click, 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 tick, tick, tick. I do it. Um, but it's false and it's exhausting and can lead to depression. Uh, my preference, actually, is for social skills training, because you need to know in social reasoning why you do various things, social systems and strategies to generalize to different situations rather than this is my script for this situation. This is new. I've never seen it before. I have no idea what to do. So it's social skills training and um, practice expressing the real you in social situations. And you may need somebody to give you guidance and role play in being true to the self so that others can understand you. I'm the sort of person who tends to look away when you're talking, helps me concentrate on what you're saying. I'm the sort of person who during break time really needs to be on my own to refresh myself rather than socializing. So it's explaining who you are rather than changing who you are but it's social skills social reasoning is better than becoming a robot or an actor excellent i've had times when i've created entire personalities and images or identities 
For example, completely molding my tastes in music and style of dress in order to be a part of a group or a subculture. How common is this when compared to a more standard profile of masking and copying traits just to play at being more social? Mm -hmm. This is where you have introversion and extroversion. And you can have autistic extroverts who want to socialize and are very keen um, and realize I will walk the walk, talk the talk. I will wear my costume. I will do what's required and be engaged and meet people who share the same intellectual interests, but I'm trying to fit into the culture too. So I think this is a, an adaptation to autism. Um, it, it's okay, it gets you by, but it still obscures the real you. And as a psychologist, I'm concerned that if you're false, the risk is not only exhaustion and, and low self-esteem, but the others may spot a fake. And that may be something that then pulls them away because they realize this is artificial. This isn't the real you. I feel uncomfortable with this. Mm -hmm. And so withdraw. So it's how they will react to that process if they suddenly see behind the mask. It is better to be true to the real self. Mm -hmm. This category is about ASD and anorexia. My daughter has high-functioning autism. She also has anorexia. She's 21 and she weighs seven stone or 98 pounds. The eating disorder service here in Essex are refusing to help her as she is autistic and they're not commissioned to work with people with autism. They say her anorexia is being driven by her autism. Everyone has washed their hands of her. Does having autism make you untreatable? Does it make you not worth treating? Any help or advice would be greatly appreciated. Wow. Uh, that's very profound. You live in Essex. I see in Essex in England. Uh, that's not too far from the Maudsley in London, where they are developing excellent programs for eating disorders in autistic individuals. More on that in a moment. So when they say they can't help her because she's autistic, that is amazing considering the research and my clinical experience would suggest that 30% at least of those in eating disorder services have autism. So in other words, a third of the people they've seen have autism, but it's been camouflaged or they've not recognized it. Now, one of the major approaches to eating disorders is what's called the Maudsley approach based on the Maudsley Hospital. Um, and what the Maudsley has recognized is that they developed a, a program that was effective, but they realized it was not so effective for autistic individuals. They were the least responsive to the program. So uh, there are now uh, individuals in uh, the Maudsley who are modifying the program. And I would recommend to this person, I, unfortunately, this is an excellent book, but I've lent it to a colleague, so I can't pick it up and show you. It's a book called Supporting Autistic People with Eating Disorders. And it's a book published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers, edited by Kate, T-C-H-A-N-T-U-R-I-A, Chantoria. Excellent. She has modified the standard program, which the people in Essex will know. They're comfortable with that. But how you can modify it to accommodate autism. Now, on that topic... I present uh, half-day and full-day um, sessions on eating disorders and, and autism. So I'm going to go through some of the motivations for an eating disorder and autism. One, self-perception, shape and weight, dislike who I am and how I look. But it's now focusing on something physical. I don't like who I am, but it must be my physique, especially for girls because other girls talk about physique. Secondly, connectedness. You're a teenager, you want to connect with others. Who do I connect with? It's finding a culture of those who accept and encourage you. And in that group, if you're autistic, you become the professor of eating disorders. You are on the internet, you're getting information. They go to you for information and your value. For some, it's puberty and sexuality to avoid it, mm -hmm. both for males and females. I don't want to become feminized. I don't want to change my physique. I just don't like change. 
not eating will prevent puberty. Fourth one here, an autistic rule. Um, this was a teenage girl who very much valued intellect. And she's not good socially, she's not good at sports, so she values her intellect. And one lunchtime, she forgot her lunch, and she started the afternoon session at school rather hungry, um, and she had a test, and she aced the test. She was fantastic. Ah, autistic rule. If I am hungry, I'm smarter. Therefore, to get good grades, I must eat less. It's what I call autistic archaeology. You go back to where this belief came from. Another is family tension at the meal table, empathic attunement because everybody's arguing with each other, and an eating disorder is a coping mechanism. The next one is knowledge of uh, food, calories, sugar, fat content becomes a special interest. You become an expert valued by peers. You can identify and connect with vegetarians and vegans, as well as food, diet and weight gurus. It becomes your lifestyle, your way of thinking. But also in anxiety, it gives you a sense of control, acquiring rigid and restrictive rules regarding food consumptions, eating rituals and routines to reduce anxiety. So those are the things that we look for. Now, one of the things we will recognize that the program needs to be adapted to accommodate the interception aspects of autism. For example, there are those with autism who don't feel hungry. It's not a motivation to eat. So um, they'll eat it because they'll be hungry one day. No, <laughs> they don't have the feelings of hunger. It also means that if you're going to work with autism, you've got to look at what are the origins of connectedness, social skills to find a group. If one of the aspects is control and anxiety, you've got to manage the anxiety. And so if one in three uh, autistic individuals have a uh, of the uh, eating disorder clinics, a lot of the work is in groups and mm -hmm. autistic individuals often hate being with neurotypicals because they're looked at, they roll their eyes, they feel very vulnerable. So you have autistic groups where all the members, one in three are autistic, you have a small group of just autistic individuals. They understand each other, they sympathize, they empathize, they give advice, they want to support each other. They don't feel vulnerable. So it's having autistic groups. So sorry, I'm, I'm getting a bit passionate about this because no, no. I think it's very important because there are people I know who are going through this at the moment and we need a combination. That's mm -hmm. going to be the solution. Those who know about eating disorders, great. And those who know about autism, need to combine to share their expertise mm -hmm. rather than use it as an excuse to deny services rather than combine for services. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Intimacy, dating, <laughs> sex and marriage. If possible, I would like to know this. Could an adult Aspie be a toxic human, a narcissist, sarcastic, egotist, insensitive, incoherent or something like that? Or is it autism that makes him look and act like that. And on top, he's not accepting, he's, he isn't accepting the fact that he's an Aspie and he's different. In fact, he finds it offensive. Okay, uh, I would call this an adaptation to autism. You know you're different. And one of the approaches is to consider yourself as inferior, defective, bad, or superior. It's a form of, of comforting. And so one of the things that I describe with such individuals who can be very prickly, denying, I'm perfect, you're the one with the mistake, is I describe it as a metaphor of a cactus. And a cactus has a prickly exterior to protect a vulnerable interior. Cacti live successfully some distance from other cacti, and that can be autism. So I would say the prickliness is to protect him. But it also means that in a way, he's got a personal schema. He's created this scaffolding, this support that I'm smarter and better than other people. And you are threatening to take away that scaffolding and potentially replace it with something that may not be as effective. Mm. 
So it's very difficult. What I do if I'm doing relationship counseling is I act as a facilitator between two different cultures. So I will take an autistic characteristic and translate it into neurotypical so the neurotypical partner can understand. But then I'll take the issues for the neurotypical and translate it into autistic speak for the autistic person to understand. It's basically communication. Mm -hmm. So really this person needs relationship counseling by someone who knows autism. Now, if they were uh, in the United States, uh, AANE have training courses uh, on relationship counseling. They're about to start a new one. So AANE would be an organization to find out. But it means trying to find someone who is experienced in explaining the two cultures in no value judgment as to why this person is, in fact, denying their autism because they created a persona and you are challenging it. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be very difficult to make that paradigm shift and it's change. And in autism, you don't like change. Mm. Speaking of relationship counseling in the same category, we have been going to relationship counseling, but I'm still experiencing a great deal of difficulty communicating with my Aspie partner. He seems to take things very personally when I share a different view, opinion, or idea of things. He does not understand, and he refuses to understand my intentions. So I try my best to talk in his language by referencing science-backed research, and I have also learned to speak with less emotions. He still has a way to turn around and argue that it's full of crap because he knows better. It occurs to me that he's extremely protective and defensive of himself, and he can often become resentful of me if I challenge. I thought Aspies are curious and tend to like investigating things, but with my partner, as soon as he senses the potential of bringing change to his life, he mm. shuts down. Is curiosity something that can be encouraged or motivated? And can it promote inclusiveness? We are unable to reach mutual agreement and hence cannot build trust, and I am feeling really stuck. Mm. You're right in that autism there is a very powerful need for information and you hope that that person will seek information on the topic to, to change, it's that sense of logic. But an inherent feature of autism is a difficulty understanding the perspective of other people. And it's also going through how your partner, your autistic partner's quality of life will be improved by adapting some of the characteristics you're recommending. Because as far as they're concerned, my life is fine. I don't need to change. I'm okay. You're the person who needs to change. But saying, but by adopting some of these strategies, this will mean that I will have more energy to help you with this. I will be able, which means you have more freedom of time to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's starting off by how this will benefit from the autistic person's perspective. Then you've got interest. Ah, there's a point to this. And then going through this together. But it's sometimes best, again, if you've got a counsellor that can be neutral and supportive. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's a lot of potential conflict, disagreement, and all those sorts of things that will inhibit those positive changes. Mm -hmm. So there are many books, again, published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers, on relationships. But the person may read all those books, but no, no, that's not me. That's not me. And it really requires a personal program. Um, yeah, uh, reaching mutual agreement and building trust, you're feeling really stuck. Yes, because the person is a heavy weight that doesn't want to move. Mm -hmm. It's an engine of a car that won't start and you're trying to push it. And I do think you need some extra assistance from somebody to help here. Good luck to that person. Mm. The last question is ASD and addiction and kindness. Dr. Tony, it wasn't until my son was addicted that the pieces fell into place. And it was obvious there was a strong, high-functioning ASD tendency in the family. We've been through the acute mental health system and criminal justice system and had all range of diagnoses, such as BPD, 
substance abuse disorder, but what I know, he is just a child born who feels very, very deeply and has a high level of intelligence. When he's not using, he's very wise and kind. So I've been wondering, could Jesus have had ASD? He was deeply compassionate, selfless, was persecuted and suffered. It's an out there thought, but one I think worth exploring. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I never thought that, but true. <laughs> Those are paradigm shift, a change in thinking. Yes. And, and, and that's autistic um, and, and compassion, and, but being attacked by the establishment because you're different. Yeah. Um, I think that is a wonderful suggestion. It is pure conjecture. We, we have um, no way of <laughs> proving yeah. that. But I really like it because it can give faith it can give support for autistic individuals mm -hmm. that other people have been tortured, crucified, but have had a, a message that it has taken thousands of years for other people to accept. And I do think um, those with autism are the revealers of the truth. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tony, we've come to the end of our questions. And I want to thank you again for all the knowledge and the insights and it's basically the fun of looking for the positive, and there is so much positive to be found out there. Thank you for that. Oh, and thank you, uh, guys. But what a wonderful uh, list of questions, especially that last one. I will be reflecting on that um, forever. <laughs> I think I suddenly click, 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 click. Yeah. There's a lot to be said. So whoever that was, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time. We'll be back again with another episode of Questions for Dr. Tony, hopefully in another month or two. So until then, please be careful. Take your shots. If you've got the opportunity, wear your masks, stay well, and we'll see you down the road.